If some of the words I've talked about so far in this level sound like Greek to you, that's because they are. In fact, some of the most delightful words in the English language are derived from Greek, and particularly from Greek names. One of my all-time favorites is Procrustean, spelled capital P, R-O-C-R-U-S-T-E-A-N. Procrustes was a robber of Attica, says the Century Dictionary, who tortured his victims by placing them on a certain bed and stretching them or lopping off their legs to adapt the body to its length. Many were maimed upon Procrustes' bed until the Greek hero Theseus tied the old bugger to his own bedposts for a permanent snooze. Today, Procrustean means producing conformity by cruel or violent means. And to place someone on a Procrustean bed is to use ruthless measures to make him conform. No less murderous in his manner of making people toe the line was Draco, a statesman of Athens whose legendary code of laws was unquestionably Procrustean. Draco prescribed the penalty of death for nearly all crimes, says the century, for smaller crimes because they merited it, and for greater because he knew of no penalty more severe. From this arbitrary administrator of Attic justice comes the word draconian, meaning ruthlessly severe. Draconian is spelled D-R-A-C-O-N-I-A-N. A more pleasant influence on the language was exercised by the philosopher Epicurus, the source of the word Epicurean, spelled E-P-I-C-U-R-E-A-N. According to the Century Dictionary, Epicurus held that pleasure is the only possible end of rational action, and the ultimate pleasure is freedom from disturbance. Although Epicurus has come to be thought of as a votary of unrestrained indulgence, in a strict sense, Epicureanism is distinguished from hedonism, which in common parlance means living for the moment. Epicurus advocated the renunciation of momentary pleasures in favor of more permanent ones, and his summum bonum, or greatest good, was the pursuit of pleasure through the practice of virtue. The word epicure, once used disparagingly of one devoted to sensual pleasure, is today used to describe a person with fastidious tastes, especially in food or wine. Ancient Greece was also home to Pyrrho, one of the great skeptic philosophers. His doctrine, says the century, was that there is just as much to be said for as against any opinion whatever, that neither the senses nor the reason are to be trusted in the least, and that when we are once convinced we can know nothing, we cease to care, and in this way alone can attain happiness. It is said that Pyrrho would take no ordinary practical precautions, such as getting out of the way of vehicles. In modern English, the word Pyrrhonism, spelled capital P-Y-R-R-H-O-N-I-S-M, means absolute skepticism, universal doubt. And the word Pyrrhonist, spelled capital P-Y-R-R-H-O-N-I-S-T, means a person who doubts everything. English has also gained some gems from the geography of ancient Greece. The rural region of Boeotia, says the century, was known for its torpid climate, which was supposed to communicate its dullness to the intellect of the inhabitants. Although three of Greece's greatest men of letters, Hesiod, Pindar, and Plutarch, were native Boeotians, Athenian city slickers reveled in reviling these bucolic folk. Today the noun Boeotian, spelled capital B O E, O-T-I-A-N, means a dull, ignorant person. And the adjective Boeotian, spelled the same way, means stupid, boring, obtuse. According to Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable, Boeotian ears are ears unable to appreciate music or rhetoric. The supercilious Athenians also disparaged the inhabitants of Arcadia and Soloi. Like the Boeotians, the Arcadians were a pastoral people, fond of music and dancing. They were considered the least intellectual of all the Greeks. 
The Greek equivalent of the word Arcadian meant a shepherd or farmer, but it had the pejorative connotation of simple-minded bumpkin. Arcadia's reputation has since been vindicated. Today, the word Arcadian, spelled capital A, R C A D I A N, is a poetic or literary way of referring to the simplicity and innocence of rustic life. Soloi was an ancient Greek colony in Cilicia, Asia Minor, whose citizens were renowned for their horrible habits of speech. That they spoke a corrupt form of Attic, the Athenian dialect, probably only made things worse for them. The Greeks thought the people of Soloi rude, pushy, and foul-mouthed, and coined the word soloikos to mean speaking or acting like an inhabitant of Soloi. By extension, speaking incorrectly or behaving in an unrefined fashion. From the Greeks' bad mouthing of these B.C. boors, we inherit the word solecism, which usually means a gross grammatical error, but which may also denote a social impropriety, as when someone sneezes in your face or belches audibly in public. Another city of Asia Minor, Laodicea, became infamous among early Christians for its lip service to the Lord. According to Brewer, the Laodiceans were indifferent to religion, caring little or nothing about the matter. When it came to believing in a higher power, Laodiceans responded with a primal shrug. Today the word Laodicean, spelled capital L-A-O-D-I-C-E-A-N, may be used either as a noun to mean an indifferent or complacent person, or as an adjective to mean indifferent or lukewarm, especially in matters of religion. Well, my Laodicean listener, if you are still listening, just think of all the solecisms you could be absorbing from listening to the radio or watching television, and tell me that my edifying interlude on Hellenisms has fallen happily upon your Boeotian ears. And with that plethora of information on interesting words that have come to us from ancient Greece, let's return to the verbal advantage vocabulary for the next ten keywords in level six. Word 22. Incessant. I-N-C-E-S-S-A-N-T. Constant. Uninterrupted. Continuous. Unceasing. Incessant combines the privative prefix in, meaning not, with the Latin cessare, to stop, cease, and means literally not ceasing, never ending. Synonyms of incessant include interminable, relentless, and unremitting. Antonyms of incessant include occasional, irregular, intermittent, incidental, sporadic, fitful, and erratic. Dictionaries often list the words continuous and continual as synonyms, and today many educated speakers use them interchangeably. They are not interchangeable, however, and the ability to distinguish continual and continuous precisely is one sign of a careful user of the language. Continual means happening again and again at short intervals. We speak of continual reminders, continual attempts, continual laughter, or the continual ringing of the telephone. Continuous means uninterrupted or unbroken. We speak of continuous noise, continuous rain, a continuous effort, or the continuous rotation of the earth. Continuous and incessant are close synonyms. The Century Dictionary explains that continuous means unbroken and is passive. Incessant means unceasing and is active. On one level, that distinction is simple. We say a railroad track or telephone cable is continuous, not incessant, because tracks and cables are inactive. But on another level, the distinction can be quite subtle and subjective. For example, we may say that a fever is continuous or incessant depending on whether we perceive it as a state or an activity. Similarly, the flow of a waterfall is continuous 
if viewed as a passive condition of a bucolic scene. It is incessant if looked upon as an active condition within that scene. The bland background music we typically hear in elevators, restaurants, and waiting rooms is continuous to those who don't mind it, but to those who are distracted or irritated by it, it's incessant, unceasing, constant, never-ending. Word 23. Sycophant. S-Y-C-O-P-H-A-N-T. A flatterer, parasite, toady, fawning follower, hanger-on. No one knows the precise origin of the words sycophant and toady, but various theories and folk etymologies abound. According to most sources, the word toady is related to toad. As the etymologist Joseph T. Shipley recounts the story in his Dictionary of Word Origins, the charlatans and mountebanks of medieval times usually traveled with an assistant who would swallow, or seem to swallow, a live toad, so that the master could display his healing powers. These helpers were called toad-eaters. Then the term came to mean a flattering follower, and the word has been shortened to toady. Sycophant is thought to come from a Greek word meaning to show figs. As the legend goes, the Athenians passed a law prohibiting the export of figs from their city. Like many laws, this one was rarely enforced. But there were always found mean fellows, says Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable, who, for their own private ends, impeached those who violated it. Hence, sycophant came to signify first a government toady, then a toady generally. Although by derivation sycophant means an informer, Today, the word refers to people who attempt to gain influence or advancement by ingratiating themselves through flattery and servility. Joanne warned Lucy her first day on the job that Ralph and Diane were the office sycophants, always sucking up to the boss and stabbing people in the back. The corresponding adjective is sycophantic. Word 24. Tangential. T-A-N-G-E-N-T-I-A-L Digressive, divergent, not closely related, slightly connected. In geometry, the word tangent refers to a line that touches a curve but does not intersect it. When you go off on a tangent, you make an abrupt change of course in what you are saying. You diverge, digress. Tangential may mean going off on a subject that is only slightly connected to the one under consideration, or it may mean slightly connected to or touching lightly on a subject. Tangential remarks diverge from the subject in question. They are only slightly connected to it. Tangential information touches lightly on the subject but is not closely related or essential to it. Word 25. Tenable. T-E-N-A-B-L-E. Defensible. Reasonable. Able to be defended, maintained, or upheld. Tenable comes from the Latin tenere, to hold, grasp. From the same source come the unusual noun tenaculum, a pointed, hooked instrument used in surgery for lifting and holding parts, such as blood vessels, and the useful adjective tenacious, which means holding firmly, as a tenacious grip or a tenacious memory. Tenable means defensible, able to be maintained or upheld. The logic behind a course of action may be tenable, defensible, or untenable, indefensible. The legislature may pass a tenable law, one that can be upheld in the courts, or an untenable law, one that will be struck down. A tenable reason is a reason that can be defended, maintained, or upheld. Word 26. Impalpable. I-M-P-A-L-P-A-B-L-E. 
incapable of being felt or understood, not able to be perceived either by the sense of touch or by the mind. Synonyms of impalpable include untouchable, imperceptible, and intangible. Antonyms include palpable, perceptible, manifest, and tangible. The adjective palpable means capable of being touched or felt, easily perceived or discerned. Palpable may be used either literally, as a palpable pulse or palpable heat, or figuratively, as a palpable error or palpable desire. The word impalpable combines palpable with the privative prefix im, meaning not, and means not able to be felt or grasped, either with the fingers or by the mind. An impalpable pulse is a sign of heart failure. An impalpable breeze is so faint as to be imperceptible. An impalpable idea is not easily grasped by the mind. Both palpable and impalpable come from the Latin palpare, to touch or stroke gently, the source also of the verb to palpate. Palpate is used chiefly in medicine to mean to examine or explore by touch, as to palpate a limb or an organ. The corresponding noun is palpation, the act of palpating, examining by touch. 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 Word 27. Odious. O-D-I-O-U-S. Hateful. Detestable. Offensive. Revolting. Arousing strong dislike or aversion. The English language has a plethora of words that mean hateful or offensive, so odious has many synonyms. Here is a selection of them, ranging from the familiar to the not-so-familiar. Disgusting, obnoxious, objectionable, disagreeable, contemptible, repellent, repugnant, loathsome, abominable, abhorrent, heinous, opprobrious, flagitious, and last but not least, the thoroughly damning word, execrable, spelled E-X-E-C-R-A-B-L-E. By derivation, execrable means expressing a curse, and today the word applies to that which is so horrible or wicked that it deserves to be cursed or damned. Odious comes from the Latin odiosus, hateful, which in turn comes from odium, hatred, the direct source of the English noun odium, spelled O-D-I-U-M. Odium and hatred are synonymous, but odium refers less frequently to hatred directed toward someone or something else, and more often to hatred experienced or incurred. Allen's supervisor was a supercilious, draconian tyrant who did not seem to care that her employees regarded her with odium. The adjective odious refers either to that which arouses hate, disgust, or displeasure, or to that which is regarded as hateful, detestable, or offensive. An odious remark is extremely unpleasant or offensive. An odious practice is a disagreeable or disgusting practice. An odious person is a person that others find hateful or detestable. The corresponding noun, odiousness, means the state or quality of being odious, as the odiousness of the crime. Be careful to distinguish the words odious and odorous, both in spelling and usage. Odorous, spelled O-D-O-R-O-U-S, means emitting an odor, having a distinct aroma or smell. Odious, spelled O-D-I-O-U-S, means hateful, detestable, revolting. Odorous armpits or odorous garbage may be odious, but there is nothing odious, hateful or offensive, about odorous flowers. Word 28. Ubiquitous. U-B-I-Q-U-I-T-O-U-S. -I -I 
T-O-U-S. Existing or seeming to exist everywhere at the same time. Ubiquitous and non-existent are antonyms. Synonyms of ubiquitous include ever-present, universal, pervading, and omnipresent. The corresponding noun is ubiquity, the state of being or seeming to be everywhere at once, omnipresence. Ubiquitous comes from the Latin ubique, everywhere. Its closest synonym, omnipresent, links the combining form omni, meaning all, with present, to mean present in all places at once. Because few things other than the air we breathe can accurately be described as ubiquitous, existing everywhere at the same time, ubiquitous is often used to mean seeming to exist everywhere at once, extremely widespread. For example, when telephones and televisions first came on the market, they were considered novelties and luxury items. But today we see them everywhere, so we could say they are ubiquitous. In George Orwell's classic novel 1984, which depicts the horrors of life in a futuristic totalitarian state, the image of the dictator, Big Brother, and the slogan, Big Brother is watching you, are ubiquitous. They seem to be in all places at once. Ubiquitous is also often used to achieve an exaggerated effect. For example, a writer might state that the cockroach is a ubiquitous insect or that graffiti has become ubiquitous in a neighborhood, or that fast food restaurant chains are now ubiquitous in our society. And if you ever have the experience of running across a certain person nearly everywhere you go, you could say that person is ubiquitous. Word 29. Ruminate. R-U-M-I-N-A-T-E. To turn over in the mind. Think about again and again. Consider carefully or at length. Synonyms of ruminate include to ponder, contemplate, meditate, deliberate, muse, cogitate, and mull, M-U-L-L. The etymology of the verb to ruminate may surprise you. It comes from the Latin ruminare to chew the cud, and by derivation means to chew over and over again. In the science of zoology, the word ruminant is used of animals that chew their cud, such as cows, oxen, sheep, goats, deer, giraffes, and camels. These ruminant creatures have multi-chambered stomachs, the first chamber of which is called the rumen, R-U-M-E-N. When a ruminant chews its cud, it is chewing food that has been swallowed, partially digested in the rumen, and then regurgitated into the mouth for thorough mastication. As you may recall from level 5, mastication means the act of chewing. By a logical extension, the verb to ruminate has come to mean to chew the cud mentally, to regurgitate a thought and turn it over and over in the mind. Just as we often say that we chew on something, we often say that we ruminate on something. Aging athletes may ruminate on the triumphs of their youth. When John heard the rumor of impending layoffs, he went back to his office at Word 30. Remuneration. R-E-M-U-N-E-R-A-T-I-O-N. Payment. Compensation or reward. Remuneration is a suitable payment or reward for a service or something one has provided. It is rare that the effort a writer expends in writing a book is commensurate with the remuneration received for writing it. When people volunteer their services for a cause, the satisfaction they get from doing something they believe in is more than enough remuneration. Mark took the job even though he knew the salary was not sufficient remuneration for the work he would have to do. Synonyms of remuneration include reimbursement, recompense, consideration, indemnification, and emolument. 
E M O L U M E N T. The corresponding verb is remunerate, to pay or compensate for services rendered, trouble taken, or goods provided. Let's review the ten key words you've just learned. This time, I'm going to give you two words, and you decide if they are synonyms or antonyms. Are you ready? Here we go. Proportionate and commensurate are synonyms. Commensurate means proportionate, corresponding in amount, measure, or degree. Also, equal of the same size or extent. Incessant and intermittent are antonyms. Intermittent means happening at intervals, periodic. Incessant means constant, uninterrupted, continuous. Sycophant and toady are synonyms. A sycophant is a flatterer, parasite. Toady, fawning follower, hanger-on. Tangential and unrelated are synonyms. Tangential means not closely related, only slightly connected, digressive, divergent. Indefensible and tenable are antonyms. Tenable means defensible, reasonable, able to be defended, maintained, or upheld. Tangible and impalpable are antonyms. Tangible means capable of being discerned by the sense of touch or realized by the mind. Impalpable means incapable of being felt or understood. Not able to be perceived either by the sense of touch or by the mind. Odious and detestable are synonyms. Odious means hateful, detestable, offensive, revolting, arousing strong dislike or aversion. Ubiquitous and non-existent are. Antonyms: Ubiquitous means existing or seeming to exist everywhere at the same time. To ruminate and to meditate are synonyms. To ruminate means to turn over in the mind, think about again and again, consider carefully or at length. Compensation and remuneration are. Synonyms: Remuneration means payment, compensation, reward. That concludes the review for this section. If you answered fewer than eight of the questions correctly in this quiz, remember to listen to the keyword discussions again before moving ahead in the program. Now let's return to the verbal advantage vocabulary for the next ten keywords in level six. Word thirty-one. Peccadillo, P E C C A D I L L O. A small sin, slight offense, minor fault or flaw. Peccadillo means literally a small sin. It comes through Spanish and Italian, ultimately from the Latin peccare, to make a mistake, blunder, sin. From the same source, English has also inherited three other useful words. Peccant, which means guilty, sinful, culpable. Peccable, which means liable to sin or do wrong, and its antonym impeccable, which means incapable of sin, unable to do wrong, and therefore free from all faults or imperfections. Impeccable is keyword forty of level four. Synonyms of peccadillo include failing, frailty. And foible, word twenty-three of level three. 
All these words suggest a weakness, imperfection, or defect of character or habit. Failing implies a relatively minor but noticeable shortcoming. Parents are never perfect. All have their failings. Frailty implies a weakness that can be exploited or that leads one to yield to temptation. Frailties are an inescapable part of human nature. Foible suggests a harmless or trivial weakness or flaw that can be easily overlooked. You may regret your failings and try to keep your frailties in check, but you can laugh about your foibles. Our keyword, peccadillo, is a small sin or slight offense that is easily forgiven. A good manager knows how to distinguish between an employee who commits peccadilloes and an employee who causes problems. You may form the plural of peccadillo either by adding es or s. Word 32. Supine. S-U-P-I-N-E. Lying down on the back with the face turned upward. He preferred to sleep in a supine position. The words supine, prone, prostrate, and recumbent all mean lying down in various ways. Supine takes its meaning directly from the Latin supinus, lying on the back with the face up. From the Latin pronus, leaning forward, we inherit the word prone, which may mean inclined or tending toward something, as in the phrase prone to error, or it may mean lying on the belly, stretched out face downward. The dog lay prone on the rug, its chin resting on its paws. The word prostrate means lying flat, stretched out, either prone or supine. Because the word comes from the Latin prosternere, to throw down in front, cast down, in modern usage, prostrate denotes lying down flat either as the result of physical or emotional exhaustion or as an expression of submission, humble adoration, humiliation, or helplessness. Be careful not to confuse prostrate with prostate, the gland in men that contributes to the production of semen and helps control urination. After age 40, a man should have regular checkups for prostate cancer, not prostrate cancer. The word recumbent comes from the Latin recumbere, to lie back, recline. When you are recumbent, you are lying down in a comfortable position, usually supine or on your side. The ancient Greeks and Romans assumed a recumbent posture when taking their meals. Visit any art museum, and you are likely to see a portrait of a recumbent nude. Word 33. Banal. B-A-N-A-L. Common, ordinary, unoriginal, flat, dull, and predictable, lacking freshness or zest. Synonyms of banal include trite, commonplace, conventional, humdrum, hackneyed, shopworn, stereotyped, insipid, vapid, and bromidic, which means like a bromide a statement or idea that is stale and dull. Antonyms of banal include creative, imaginative, unconventional, unorthodox, ingenious, innovative, novel, and pithy. Banal, which came into English from French in the mid-18th century, originally referred to the facilities shared in common by the serfs and tenants of a feudal manor such as the mill, the ovens, and the wine press. In this now obsolete sense, banal meant shared by all, used by the whole community. From this notion of commonality, banal soon came to be used as a synonym of common in its sense of ordinary and unoriginal. Today, banal is used of anything that is flat, dull, and predictable, that lacks freshness or zest. A television show, a song, a book, a movie, a remark, a conversation, a desire, a relationship, 
and even a person can be described as banal. When you consider how many things in this world are dull, ordinary, and unoriginal, banal suddenly becomes a useful word to add to your vocabulary. In concluding this discussion of banal, I must address the issue of the word's pronunciation. If you've ever heard this word before, you may have heard a pronunciation different from the one I prefer. For example, you may have heard someone say banal, or banal, or perhaps even banal. In my first book on pronunciation, There is No Zoo in Zoology, I wrote that banal is a word of many pronunciations, each of which has its outspoken and intractable proponents. When I published that book in 1988, the pronunciation banal was the one preferred by the overwhelming number of authorities of the last century. However, when the editors of the third edition of the American Heritage Dictionary, published in 1993, asked the members of their prestigious usage panel which pronunciation they preferred, 46% chose banal, 38% chose banal, and 14% chose banal, which the dictionary notes is more common among British speakers. Banal, preferred by several early 20th century authorities, appears to be almost defunct, for it was the choice of only 2% of the usage panel. What all this boils down to is that there are three acceptable pronunciations for this word. Banal, banal, and banal. As the American Heritage Dictionary puts it, speakers can perhaps take comfort in knowing that any one of these pronunciations will have the support of a substantial minority, and that none of them is incorrect. On the other hand, there is virtually no disagreement about the pronunciation of the corresponding noun, banality, which means the quality or state of being common, ordinary, and unoriginal, as the banality of primetime TV or the banality of workaday life. Word 34. Heterodox. H-E-T-E-R-O-D-O-X. Having or expressing an opinion different from the accepted opinion. Not in agreement with established doctrine or belief. As you may recall from the discussion of heterogeneous, word 6 of level 3, the prefix hetero means other, different, unlike. Heterosexual means attracted to the other sex. Heterogeneous means consisting of different elements or kinds, diverse. And heterodox means having another opinion or different beliefs. The dox in heterodox comes from the Greek doxa, an opinion, which in turn comes from the verb dokain, to think. From the same source come the rare English words doxy, D-O-X-Y, an opinion or doctrine, especially a religious opinion, and doxastic, spelled D-O-X-A-S-T-I-C, which means pertaining to opinion or to the formation of an opinion. I wouldn't expect you to know those unusual words, but you may be familiar with doxology, spelled D-O-X-O-L-O-G-Y. Doxology combines the Greek doxa, opinion, with the verb legain, to speak. The word is used in Christian worship to mean an expression of praise to God, usually in the form of a brief hymn or chant. The antonym of heterodox is orthodox, agreeing with established opinion, adhering to accepted beliefs. A heterodox custom, or a heterodox view, goes against the prevailing norm. An orthodox custom or view is considered proper or correct. The prefix ortho, O-R-T-H-O, means right, upright, proper, or correct. Ortho appears in a number of useful English words. Orthodontics is the dental specialty of correcting irregularities of the teeth. Orthoscopic means having normal or correct vision. Orthography, which comes from ortho, right, correct, and the Greek verb graphane, to write, means correct spelling. An orthographic error is a misspelled word or typographical mistake. Finally, the word orthoepi, 
which comes from ortho and the Greek epos, meaning word, refers to the study of the proper pronunciation of words. Orthoepi may also be pronounced orthoepi, which just goes to show you that when it comes to pronunciation, even the experts don't always agree. However, you will run into trouble if you use heterodox pronunciations, ones different from those acceptable to most educated speakers. The adjectives heterodox and heretical both mean having or expressing a controversial opinion or belief, but the words differ in their intensity. Heterodox applies to that which differs in a way that does not necessarily challenge or threaten the norm. Heretical applies to that which differs from the norm in a way perceived as dangerously false. Sub Word 35. Grandiloquent. G-R-A-N-D-I-L-O-Q-U-E-N-T. Characterized by lofty, high-flown language full of grand or high-sounding words. Synonyms of grandiloquent include bombastic, grandiose, florid, and turgid. All these words suggest speech or writing that is inflated, affected, or extravagant. Antonyms of grandiloquent include plain-spoken, forthright, unaffected, and candid. Grandiloquent combines the word grand with the suffix iloquent, which comes from the Latin loqui, meaning to speak. By derivation, grandiloquent means speaking in a grand manner. The Latin loqui is also the source of loquacious, talkative, and colloquial, word 43 of level 3, which means pertaining to informal speech or conversation. Believe it or not, the English language has more than 20 words that incorporate the suffix eloquent and designate different ways of speaking. Of course, most of them reside quietly in the depths of unabridged dictionaries and are rarely used, but here are a few you may find useful. Magniloquent comes from the Latin magnus, meaning great, large, and means speaking pompously, using grand or high-flown language. Magniloquent and grandiloquent are virtually interchangeable. From the Latin multus, meaning many or much, comes multiloquent, using many words, talking up a storm. And from the Latin brevis, meaning short, comes the word breviloquent, speaking briefly. When you speak in an urbane, sophisticated manner, you are suaviloquent. When you speak like a scholar or an expert on some subject, you are doctiloquent. When you speak solemnly or of sacred matters, you are sanctiloquent. And if you talk in your sleep, you are somniloquent. Word 36. Lugubrious. L-U-G-U-B-R-I-O-U-S. Mournful and gloomy. Expressing sadness or sorrow often in an exaggerated, affected, or ridiculous way. Synonyms of lugubrious include dismal, melancholy, dreary, funereal, doleful, dolorous, disconsolate, plaintive, woeful, lachrymose, and saturnine. Antonyms of lugubrious include cheerful, jubilant, Joyous, gleeful, mirthful, jovial, word 19 of level 5, and sanguine, S-A-N-G-U-I-N-E. Lugubrious comes ultimately from the Latin lugere, to mourn or lament. The word was coined about 1600 and was at first merely a grandiloquent synonym for mournful and sorrowful. By the 1800s, however, it had come to suggest mournful, dismal, or gloomy in an exaggerated, affected, or ridiculous way. According to the second edition of Webster's New International Dictionary, the words lugubrious and doleful have weakened from their original meaning and are often used with a half-humorous connotation.
For example, lugubrious music is mournful or gloomy to an extreme. The expression, woe is me, is now a lugubrious cliché. The mournful howling of a dog may be lugubrious. And if the expression on a person's face is lugubrious, it is sad or sorrowful in an affected, almost ludicrous way. The corresponding noun is lugubriousness. The adverb is lugubriously, as he spoke lugubriously about the company's financial condition. Word 37. Infinitesimal. I-N-F-I-N-I-T-E-S-I-M-A-L. Too small to be measured or calculated. Synonyms of infinitesimal include tiny, minute, microscopic, and minuscule. By the way, are you wondering why I said minuscule instead of minuscule? Minuscule and the word minus both come from the Latin minus, which means smaller, and minuscule is spelled like minus plus c-u-l-e. Given that, it would perhaps be logical to pronounce the word minuscule, except that logic and usage don't always concur, and people have never seen fit to say it that way. The pronunciation minuscule, now common among educated speakers, probably came about as a result of the persistent misspelling of the word as though it began with the prefix mini, M-I-N-I-S-C-U-L-E. The misspelling is now so widespread that most current dictionaries list it as a variant without comment, and many also list the pronunciation minuscule first. I would argue, however, that the alternative spelling and pronunciation are not only at variance with the word's history, but are also, quite frankly, idiotic. Look in any dictionary, and you will see that the noun minuscule refers to a small cursive script used in medieval manuscripts, and from that sense it came to denote either a small or lowercase letter, or something printed in lowercase letters. Because the adjective minuscule originally meant pertaining to that small medieval script, or consisting of small letters, by natural extension, minuscule also came to mean tiny, very small. As with the proverbial chicken and the egg, it's hard to say which came first, the misspelling of minuscule or the mispronunciation of it. In general, our misspellings tend to mimic our mispronunciations, and in this case the evidence suggests that probably from association with the words minimum, minimal, and miniature, minuscule first came to be mispronounced minuscule and then later misspelled with the prefix mini, which means small. Today, the variant pronunciation minuscule is so popular that I can't in good conscience tell you that it's wrong, but I can at least admonish and implore you to spell the word properly. There is no mini in minuscule, and even if you choose to say minuscule, for goodness sake, remember that when you write the word, it should be spelled like minus plus C-U-L-E. Well, now that we've straightened out that minuscule but not insignificant point of usage, I'm afraid that we've lost track of our keyword, infinitesimal. Of course, that's not surprising, because this rather large 13-letter word means infinitely small, and applies to that which is smaller than you can imagine. Unlike the words tiny, minute, and minuscule, which simply mean very small, and unlike microscopic, which means too small to be seen without a microscope, infinitesimal is smaller still, and means specifically too small to be measured or calculated. Occasionally, you will come across a writer or speaker who is unaware of the specific meaning of infinitesimal, and who uses it loosely. For example, in your local newspaper, you might see a sentence like this. Scientists detected an infinitesimal amount of mercury and lead in the city's tap water. Because infinitesimal properly applies to that which is too small to be measured or even detected, that sentence should read like this. In a test of the city's tap water, scientists determined that if mercury and lead were present, the amounts were infinitesimal. Word 38. Goad. 
G-O-A-D. To prod or urge to action, stimulate, arouse, stir up. Synonyms of the verb to goad include to egg on, spur, incite, impel, and instigate. Antonyms of goad include soothe, pacify, appease, assuage, word 37 of level 2, and mollify, M-O-L-L-I-F-Y. The noun a goad is a pointed stick used to prod animals and get them to move. From that sense, goad also came to mean a stimulus, spur, incitement, anything that urges or drives something on. The verb to goad literally means to prick or drive with a goad, hence to prod or urge to action. Someone can goad you to work harder, goad you to admit a fault or mistake, or goad you to the point of irritation or anger. In Measure for Measure, Shakespeare writes, Most dangerous is that temptation that doth goad us on. Word 39. Malinger. M-A-L-I-N-G-E-R. To pretend to be sick or incapacitated so as to avoid work or duty. To shirk or dodge responsibility by feigning illness or inability. Don't be misled by the presence of the word linger in malinger. Despite what some people mistakenly believe, to malinger does not mean to linger, loiter, or hang around in a shiftless or threatening way. Although you might hear or read about drug pushers malingering near schoolyards or homeless people malingering downtown, don't believe it. Those people may be loitering, but they are definitely not malingering. For malinger means to pretend to be sick or incapacitated so as to avoid work or duty. The verb to malinger comes from a French word meaning sickly, ailing, infirm, and is apparently related to the word malady, spelled M-A-L-A-D-Y, which means an illness or affliction. The corresponding noun is malingerer, a person who malingers. When the words malinger and malingerer entered English in the early 1800s, they were used of soldiers and sailors who shirked their duty by pretending to be sick. Of course, malingering is popular among the entire workforce, not just members of the military, so it wasn't long before malinger and malingerer came to be used of anyone who dodges work or responsibility by feigning illness or inability. Word 40. Aver. A-V-E-R. To state positively, declare with confidence. Synonyms of the verb to aver include assert, affirm, avow, profess, contend, and asseverate. To state means to express something in an explicit and usually formal manner. You state your answer or state your opinion. To declare means to state publicly or out loud, sometimes in the face of opposition. You declare your intentions, declare your position, or declare your independence. To assert means to declare forcefully or boldly, either with or without proof. You assert a belief or assert your rights. To asseverate means to declare in a solemn, earnest manner. Lawyers asseverate their claims in court. Professors asseverate their theories from a lectern. And preachers asseverate their spiritual advice from the pulpit. To affirm means to state with conviction. Declare as a fact based on one's knowledge or experience. You can affirm the truth, affirm your presence, or affirm the existence of something. Our keyword, to aver, means to state positively and decisively, with complete confidence that what one says is true. You can aver that you have never disobeyed the law. You can aver that you have always paid your taxes on time. You can aver that you have never used alcohol or drugs. And you can aver that there is life on the planet Mars. 
Of course, if you aver all that, then other people probably will aver that you are either lying or off your nut. So it's always wise to watch what you aver. State positively, declare with confidence. Let's review the 10 key words you've just learned by playing one of these definitions doesn't fit the word. I will say a word followed by three apparent synonyms, but only two of those three words or phrases will be true synonyms. One will be unrelated in meaning. You have to decide which one of the three ostensible synonyms or phrases doesn't fit the word. Are you ready? Here we go. A peccadillo is a small sin, small oversight, slight offense. Small oversight doesn't fit. A peccadillo is a small sin, slight offense, minor fault or flaw. Supine means lying on the back, lying face up, lying prone. Lying prone doesn't fit. Prone means lying on the belly with the face down. Supine means lying on the back with the face turned upward. Banal means inappropriate, unoriginal, ordinary. Inappropriate is the inappropriate word in this case. Banal means common, ordinary, unoriginal, lacking freshness or zest, flat, dull, and predictable. Heterodox means having an unaccepted opinion, having an unconventional opinion, having an unreasonable opinion. Having an unreasonable opinion doesn't fit. When the Italian astronomer Galileo affirmed the Copernican theory that the Earth rotates on its axis and revolves around the Sun, it was not scientifically unreasonable. In the early 1600s, however, that theory was considered not only heterodox, but heretical. And for expressing agreement with it, Galileo was imprisoned by the Inquisition and excommunicated by the Church. Heterodox means having or expressing an opinion different from the accepted opinion, not in agreement with established doctrine or belief. Grandiloquent means high-minded, high-sounding, high-flown. High-minded doesn't fit. Grandiloquent means characterized by lofty, high-flown language, full of grand or high-sounding words. Lugubrious means mournful, gloomy, grotesque. Grotesque doesn't fit. Grotesque means distorted, ugly, outlandish, or bizarre. Lugubrious means mournful and gloomy, expressing sadness or sorrow, often in an exaggerated, affected, or ridiculous way. Infinitesimal means tiny, invisible, minute. Invisible doesn't fit. Many things that cannot be seen by the naked eye can still be measured or counted. Infinitesimal means tiny, minute, too small to be measured or calculated. To goad means to order, urge, prod. Order doesn't fit. To order means to command or instruct. To goad means to prod or urge to action, stimulate, arouse, stir up. To malinger means to pretend to be sick, avoid work or duty, hang around aimlessly. Hang around aimlessly doesn't fit. To malinger means to pretend to be sick or incapacitated so as to avoid work or duty. To aver means to state positively, promise earnestly, declare confidently. Promise earnestly doesn't fit. To aver means to state positively, declare with confidence. That concludes the review for this section.